high above the traffic of the Strand, from a dingy room at the top of Marconi House, came the first voice of the British Broadcasting Company. 2LO, the London station of the British Broadcasting Company calling. Here is the news, copyright by Reuter, Press Association, Exchange Telegraph and Central News. Today, His Majesty the King opened the British Empire exhibition at Wembley. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwillingly to school. London calling. We are now taking you over to the Savoy Hotel for dance music by the Savoy Orpheans and Havana bands until midnight. The first general manager of the BBC was a young Scots engineer, John Reith. He had very high hopes of his new organisation, but he knew that they would all have to be very careful. There was opposition from theatre managers about possible theatre programmes, and the biggest opposition of all from newspapers. The BBC had to take its own news programmes from Reuters. It couldn't produce its news programmes itself. The early repertoire consisted mainly of songs, recitals and talks. Talks with somewhat forbidding titles like The Decrease of Malaria in Great Britain or How to Become a Veterinary Surgeon. First of all, I must apologise for my voice. Since my last talk, I've had the somewhat alarming experience, common to most broadcast actors, of hearing my own voice on the blathnophone. When I heard it on this curious instrument, I was frankly horrified. This is uh, a crystal set of about 1922. They went on making for some years. And the, it demonstrates how simple radio was in those early days. This wireless set consists of three parts. A cardboard tube wound with a coil, which is tuned with a simple slider. A lump of rock crystal, uh, which is tickled uh, with what's called a cat whisker. It's a spiral of wire. This rectified the incoming signal. Now, all you did was you connected it up with your 100 foot of aerial, another wire to the earth or to a water pipe, not a gas pipe, they used to say, because if there was an electrical storm, you may blow up the house. You simply clamped your earphones on the problem in those days was that the air was empty. There was one programme broadcast. The difficulty was finding that one spot, that sensitive spot that would tune it in. At first, the only people who could hear us at all clearly were those who lived in the big towns, where the BBC had set up its first small power transmitters. Great areas of Britain were still out of range, but on July the 27th, 1925, opening of the BBC High Power Station at Daventry. Daventry 5XX reaches 23 million listeners. Station 5XX heard clearly throughout the whole country. Daventry calling, Daventry calling, Daventry calling, dark and still. We regret to have to announce that all efforts at compromise between the Trades Union Council and the government regarding the position in the coal fields having failed, a general strike will begin tomorrow at midnight. The general strike is highly significant 
not only because the BBC managed to retain its independence throughout it, but because many people listened then to radio for the first time. This is London Calling. I have here a very important statement. Soon after midday today, the TUC asked the Prime Minister to receive them. And an interview took place at Downing Street between the... Once the strike began, most newspapers stopped. And as far as the BBC was concerned, the news agencies also temporarily abandoned the content and timing of BBC news bulletins, leaving them to the BBC itself. It broadcast five of them a day. And it was Reith himself who announced the end of the strike, followed by a reading of William Blake's Jerusalem. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear. O oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. <laughs> 